How's it going? It's good to see you. I'm glad you're watching this video. My name is Thomas Brush. I'm the creator of a game called Pinstripe. I'm also working on a game called Once Upon a Coma. Now, I've been making games for 10 years, but when I first started making games, the whole concept of making a 2D platformer or a 2D game was really daunting. I just didn't understand how to, to put all the moving pieces together. So I'm going to distill that down for you in this video and give you the basics of making a 2D platformer so that you can get started. All right, guys, you ready? Let's go. So this is my Photoshop file with my scene artwork inside of it. Now, you can make a game with tiles, and there's plenty of YouTube videos on that, um, but you can also create artwork in individual frames. Um, and in this case, we've actually created essentially two 16 by nine canvases. And so the player can run basically twice the width of your screen. So if you take a look here, it's about two of the 16 by nines. And if you look at the actual image size here, just if you're curious, it's 7,680 pixels by 2,189 pixels. Now this is how the scene is set up in Photoshop. It's these simple layers here with a foreground element, some grass, which is where the player will run. You've got a cool tree here with a little egg. You've got these bushes, and then you've got this background image. Now obviously if you want to have as many layers as you possibly can, that's really cool. Um, you just don't want to slow down the player's machine too much with all of that content. But games like Hollow Knight, for example, have a ton of layers and it really makes the game feel alive, um, makes the game shine. In this case though, we're going to have just six layers here and we're going to actually export these as PNGs and bring them inside of Unity. So let's go ahead and export them. Photoshop layers to PNG is a really cool script um, and it's included in the link in the description and it allows us to export these layers as PNGs. Now Unity can import a PSD file and that's totally fine and I believe Unity is actually slowly rolling out a tool that will actually break apart your Photoshop file into layers but for the purposes of this tutorial depending on which version of Unity you're using I think we can easily use this script here and export to PNGs inside of Unity. So let's just go ahead and export these as layers. So these are all exported now inside of a folder called Layers. All right, let's jump into Unity. So here we are inside of Unity. Now all we've got is a main camera. It's a blank scene here. So notice how we're in 2D mode here. If you deselect it, you can see we're actually in a 3D space. But let's click 2D so that we're actually going to see a flat plane and the camera will basically be orthographic in instead of perspective. Now you can see that my projection mode for my camera is set to orthographic. Uh, perspective would be um, what a 3D camera would use, and perspective automatically would create that parallax effect, and I'll show you that in a second. But we're actually going to create our own parallax script. Um, so for now, make sure that that's set to orthographic, set your size to 10, and that will just allow the artwork that we're creating to be inside of that camera viewport. So let's go ahead and just drag all of these into our scene. Now, believe it or not, there is a tool that I like to use and it's on GitHub and it's called Photoshop to layers. And you can actually take a Photoshop file, break out its PNG layers, and then have those layers brought into the scene so that you don't have to move everything around and lay everything out. But for the purposes of this tutorial, I actually want to show you how you can do sorting layers and position your sprites so that they look good in a 2D space. All right, let's go ahead and take this foreground element. Let's start from the top here. Foreground, we're going to want to put it in the foreground sorting layer and you can create your foreground sorting layer by clicking add sorting layer, but we've already got it here. So we're going to click foreground. Let's just set it to five because we might want to put something behind that eventually. We've also got our grass, so let's just, I like to bring things up close to one another as they descend down the z-axis. So we have our grass, and that's going to be set on our player plane, set to 1. Our player is going to be at 0. Bushes, we're going to put behind the player in BG. And let's just set that to 5 because we're going to go down slowly. The tree is actually in front of the bushes, so that's going to be BG 0, or BG6, 5, the egg will be BG6 as well. And then this reference image is actually supposed to be called sky reference. Let's just call it sky actually. And we're just going to make that BG. All right, so let's go ahead and position everything nice and snug. There we go. Bring it all down to about there. 
bring our tree down to about there, our bushes down, and we have a scene. All right, guys, so this is all laid out clean and precisely inside of Unity. And we're just gonna create an empty game object and call this frame one. I like to call these little vignettes, these little screen boxes, frames. And we could put all of our PNGs and game objects inside of this parent object. Be sure you zero things out. You don't need them to be in weird positions. And just make them all a child of frame one here. So as you can see, we can move all of this inside of one game object. And this is our frame one. Our camera, let's zero that out as well. I like things to be nice and clean. Ne negative 10 would probably be a good position for it on the Z axis. So let's go ahead and change the Z axis position for all of these PNGs. Now this is really important because it's gonna allow us to have that parallax feel. So for the sky, we'll put it at maybe, let's see, 10. Egg, maybe five. The bushes could be six. Move these down here, yep. Let's make the egg actually three. The tree three, and you'll see what I'm doing here in just a second. We're gonna keep the plane at which the, or the, we're gonna keep the graphic at which the player is walking on, on the zero position. So that's gonna be at zero. And then foreground will actually be negative four. Now watch this. This is what we just accomplished. Now we have a scene that is actually in 3D space. I like to imagine it as kind of like a puppet show. So now we have everything laid out just like that. But for the purposes of this tutorial, we're gonna keep it in 2D space. Now let's go ahead and create our character. Now this, believe it or not, is one of the easiest parts of making a game because so many tools are available and scripts are available online um, for you to download and just use out of the box. So I've actually included a link in the description for a script that actually, that Unity provided. And you can take a look at that script and see if it works for you. So let's go ahead and create an empty game object call it player again be sure you zero things out keep everything nice and clean trust me you want things to be clean when you're making a game because it can get very complicated very fast so we're just going to use the, the script called player platform controller make sure you bring in that script into unity after you've downloaded it you're also going to want to add a rigid body 2d here make sure it's set to kinematic simulated use full kinematic contacts and you also want to have a capsule collider. Mine is at 0.38 and 0.9. The size is really whatever you want it to be. Now the reason you use a capsule instead of a square is because squares corners will actually dig into hitboxes, cause the player to get stuck. So you have a capsule collider here. And also, as we stated before, you have your platform, player platformer controller script that we downloaded. Um, I want my script to be at 15 jump max speed of seven. We've got gravity modifier of 1.5. And then these two scripts will actually explain when we actually start animating our character. So we've got this character in the scene here. Now to be able to see it, let's actually just add a sprite. And then let's just bring in a sprite that we have just so we can see what things look like. How about we bring in that egg? How's that sound? Now let's make sure that your sorting layer is set to player and we have our egg here <laughs> so let's just make sure that everything works okay um, so we're going to get go ahead and hit play and ensure that everything is working well okay as you can see it's not at least our player is falling the reason why is you guessed it we need to add an empty child we're going to call this hitbox and it can be anywhere inside of frame one, but we're gonna zero it out because we like to zero things out. Be careful about your Z axis. Let's zero that out. So there we go. Now let's add our polygon collider. Now what you could do is you could actually click on grass here and go ahead and get polygon collider placed on top of that PNG. And Unity will do something which is really amazing. Um, it will actually add all of the different vertices um, for the various transparent pixels associated with this grass. But we don't wanna do that because that's a little crazy. Like if grass was made out of pieces of glass or something, that would make sense. But for a video game, you always wanna be keep things pretty smooth. So let's remove that and actually go to our hitbox here, create a polygon collider. And as you can see, it's created a one, two, three, four, five, a hectagon. Wait, 
Is that a hectagon or a pentagon? What is it? <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to bring this down. Let me know in the comments what kind of shape that is because I'm an idiot. Um, we're going to bring this down and actually start dragging things out. So all you got to do is just click. See that? It's really amazing. Um, there you go. Just slowly bring things out. You want it to be below the grass because you want Pete to be running through the grass. And Pete is going to be our character, by the way. So he'll just be running through this grass, just like so. Very good. Make sure you extend these down to the bottom. Try and keep things clean. The way that you delete a vertice, by the way, or a point, as Unity would call it, is you click Control Command. Oh, and by the way, we clicked Edit Collider here, just if you're confused. So we can c command or control click here and it removes that. So now things look pretty clean and we'll just make sure we have some bleed as it goes over the edge here because we don't want the player to accidentally fall off the map if he's just towards the edge here. So I like to bring a little bleed out. Just like that. Trust me, you want things to be as clean as possible when you're making games. I know I've said this before. Make sure you're being patient as you make your game because things are going to get really complicated really fast. Looks like everything is working great. We can jump, we can run, and <laughs> obviously we want to change the character graphic. So before we change our character graphic, let's actually get the camera to follow our little egg looking thing here. What we're going to use is something called Cinemachine. Now when I was maybe five years younger, I thought I had to create an entire camera camera script from scratch. Um, and that's just not true anymore. Cinemachine does the trick. It's really amazing. So let's go ahead, click on our camera, then go to Cinemachine Create 2D Camera. All right, as you can see, this weirdly named game object was created, and then this red little Cinemachine logo was added to our camera. Let's go ahead and drag this to there so that they're next to each other. What this is doing is actually controlling the camera. So the only script that was actually added to our camera was the Cinemachine brain. We don't really need to do anything with this, but we can edit all sorts of cool variables inside of the CMVCam1 inside of the Cinemachine virtual camera script. What's cool about the way this works is you can have multiple virtual camera game objects that are deactivated and activated and control only one camera. So what that means is instead of having six or seven cameras all with different traits, we actually only have six or seven game objects that you can activate and deactivate to control one camera. We're not going to worry about that though here. We're just going to use one CM VCam1 and we're going to control the main camera. So at the very beginning here, you just want to make sure that you're setting the follow object to our character. Now, as you can see in the game window, we actually now have a cool little grid that shows us all of our guides. So this is the move space where the player can move. This is where that he can move freely without the camera actually doing anything. And this is where the camera will actually speed up to catch up to him. So if you're falling, for example, the camera will um, not ease anymore and actually just catch up to the player. Let's hit play and see what happens. So far, so good. And we can just disable those guides to get a better look at what this looks like. So let's actually change the screen Y here. There we go. We can shift it a little bit. There we go. And then we can just say save during play. And then it should keep it at 0.75. Let's uncheck that now that it's saved. Let's go ahead and save our scene. And finally, what we want to do is make sure that we bring our character down so that he's not constantly falling. <laughs> Notice how the camera is actually following the player while we're in editor, mo editor mode. That's pretty cool. So we can just put him right there. The camera is following our player. Now, if you notice, there's no parallaxing. And what parallaxing is, is actually the background moving slower um, and then the foreground moving faster causing that depth of field appearance. The reason why that's not happening is because our main camera is actually set to orthographic. So if we change it to perspective mode, you'll notice that everything kind of gets zoomed in and looks weird. So if we go to our actual camera controller here and change the field of view, we can zoom out again and then hit play. Now watch what happens. Suddenly we get that parallax, right? Pretty cool. Now the problem with this kind of parallax is it actually scales everything. 
like normal vision, things that are far away are actually smaller. And we don't really want to do that because we've already done that in Photoshop. Notice how the bushes in the background here are pretty small. You've got a small little windmill back there. So we've already created that effect. So how do we ensure that the sprites stay the same size and don't actually shift in scale? Well, instead of doing a perspective camera, what we can do is actually create a fake parallax. Now, instead of writing your own parallax script, be like me, just go find one online and use it. Now, there's this really cool parallax script I found on one of Unity's forum posts. Thank you to whoever wrote this, um, you rock. I'm including this forum post in this video and I really appreciate you writing that script. So let's go ahead and look at our scripts. Now, we've got three scripts here. We've got parallax background script, parallax camera script, and parallax layer script. Now these are pretty rudimentary, work out of the box, and you can probably edit them to make them a little bit more robust, but for now, I think they make a lot of sense for this video, so let's go ahead and use them. Let's click on frame one and go ahead and add parallax background. This is essentially gonna control the parallax camera. Let's add a parallax camera script to our camera, and then finally, let's add a layer to each one of the sprites. We don't wanna add one to the, the hitbox, because the hitbox is not going to move. So what's going to happen is each one of these sprites is going to move and shift slowly. It's actually going to translate um, at runtime according to the camera's position. So here we have a parallax layer added to each one of our game objects. We don't want one added to the hitbox though. Don't want to add one to the actual container for our sprites. All we're adding there is our parallax background. So what you'll notice here is a parallax factor. So basically what we're gonna do here is anything that's maybe two is gonna multiply by that speed based on the camera's position. So let's go ahead and just make the grass here zero. We don't want anything to do there. But for the tree, we, can, we want it to be maybe 0.3. The egg, we want 0.4. The bushes, 0.5. And then the sky, 0.6. Let's see if that did anything. We've got some nice parallax. I really like that. So things feel a little bit disorienting here and I can tell you why. First, the background is actually a little too far back. So let's just make it 0.9. And the foreground itself is actually incorrect. What we need to do is multiply it by a negative factor because when things are in front, really close to the camera, they actually move pretty fast. We're gonna parallax the foreground at a, at a rate of negative 0.2. Let's hit play. All right, this should do it guys. Great, so the, the foreground is actually moving faster than the grass. So look at what's happening actually in the scene view. See that guys? We're tricking the mind. We're making the player feel like things are actually 3D when they're really not. Again, take a look. This is actually the scene. There's no depth actually occurring, but it looks like there is. Now let's go ahead and add our player graphic. What we can do is actually use something called Spine 2D. Spine is going to take Photoshop files, take those layers, make them have bones and skeletal structures, allowing you to animate them, and then you can export those animations into Unity. Now, if any of you have seen my previous video about creating 2D animations in Unity, um, you will actually understand a lot of what's going on here. I suggest to the people watching this video to watch what we're working on now, and then go check out that video later to learn a lot more about Spine 2D. So we've got a ton of different pieces of artwork for our character here that we've already created. Um, don't get too overwhelmed here. Um, all you really need to know, because a lot of these layers are actually just various skins and different graphics to create different characters other than our protagonist. But for now, just worry about these graphics that you see right in front of you. We've got a chest here. We've got a head. We've got hair, arms, etc all sorts of cool stuff. And we can actually go ahead and just like we did with our scene art, we can go Photoshop layers to PNG, export them, and you should be good. So go ahead and click OK. So let's go ahead and jump inside of Spine and I wanna show you exactly what you can create here. So we've already created our character and all of his animations. Again, if you wanna see how we did this, there's a link in the description with the video to watch how we actually made this character. But what's cool here is we have all of our different bones and joints that we can rotate and move and animate for our character. So if we go into our animation view here, you can actually see that there's a cool sort of standing animation. Let's see here. 
I've got a skateboarding animation, I've got a running animation, dancing animation, attacking. There's just a ton of different ways that you can create cool animations. You can really create as many animations as you want. So we're gonna go ahead and actually export all of these animations. So let's go to our art folder. Then we've created a spine folder, which is gonna include all of our animations and the output of those animations. Let's create a folder called output. And what's gonna be exported is JSON files and a texture atlas file. The JSON is gonna tell Unity what to do with all of these PNGs that are being created and how they connect to one another, how the bones actually work. So go ahead and click export. You'll notice that all of our data was exported. We have a character atlas, we have a JSON file, we have an atlas text file, and we have actual art here that shows all of the different sprites that were exported. And then finally we have a material here which is going to be set to spine skeleton. So what you want to do here is actually first create a skeleton data and that's going to be in the spine category here. If you're not seeing that, it's because you haven't actually installed the spine runtime inside of Unity. So click the link in the description and there will be a, a link to a spine runtime that you can use on PC or Mac. Go ahead and bring that into Unity. Just drag and drop it into your assets folder and it will import all of the scripts you need to be able to start editing your spine files. So now that you've done that, go ahead and create your first skeleton data. This is going to be called character skeleton data. And as you can see, we can actually have a place to drag our JSON file. And then also we want to drag our Atlas file just like that. Now, if some of you are getting errors, it could be that your Atlas text file is not being referenced by your Atlas asset file kind of confusing, kind of a lot going on, but don't stress out too much. Just drag your character atlas text file to this field here. Make sure your character material is set. And so this skeleton data is, I like to think of the parent of all of this stuff. It's kind of taking all of this information and putting inside of one asset that Unity can use to create an animation. And then finally, the last thing we're going to want to do is create an animator controller and we're going to call it character controller and notice it doesn't have any animations inside of it yet and that's because we haven't told the animator which animations to actually bring into it a little confusing here but click on skeleton animator inside of your skeleton data asset drag in your character controller to this section here and then just click force update animation clips and as you can see all of the animations that we had in Spine are now a child of our character controller asset. Now that we've got all that, let's go ahead and bring our character into our scene. Now ignore these removed assets. These are actually removed for the purposes of this tutorial. You will not see anything like this. You're going to want to add a skeleton mechanism component. Click that. And you'll notice all of these different things were created at once. We have an animator, which we can drag our character controller to. We have mesh renderer, and then we also are going to have this section here, the skeleton mechanism, which will include our skeleton data. Drag that there. Make sure the skin is set to the correct one. Now these are all the different skins I can use for this one skeleton. In our case, we're gonna use Pete because he's the main character. He is our hero. Click Pete, and then set the sorting layer to player zero. If you notice, he's pretty big here. We don't want him that big. So instead of scaling down your actual character controller to some random point value, let's keep him one. But what we can do is actually go to our skeleton data here and actually set the scale here. How about 0 0.0278? <laughs> there we go. So we've got Pete here set up inside of our actual character controller. So that's because we have the skeleton mechanism the mesh renderer, and then we also have our animator on here. All right, so before we actually get started changing the animator state machine and actually telling Unity which animations to play when, I wanna jump into the script really quick and actually show you what's going on under the hood. So as you can see, it's pretty generic. There's nothing crazy going on here, and I'm just gonna run through really quick what each section is doing. So first, we're actually just going to detect when the horizontal 
axis is being inputted into Unity. And that's just a quick way to tell move.x, which is the speed of the x position, um, when to increase. So anytime we press the horizontal axis, that move.x is going to increase. It's also going to look for the jump button and if we're grounded. And that grounded variable is actually determined by the physics object class, which is a parent of this class. And then we're also going to detect when the players hit jump, our velocity is going to increase as long as it's not been increased already, meaning no double jumping. Finally, we're going to tell Unity to flip the local scale of our graphic, which our graphic in this case is simply the game object itself. If you Finally, this section here is actually probably the most important regarding our state machine. We're telling the animator state machine to set a Boolean grounded to whatever the grounded variable is inside of this script. We're also going to tell animator what the velocity is of our character. So we'll cover that in just a second. Don't worry. It'll all make sense, I promise. And really quick, we also have these two functions here. One is called footstep, which will just play a footstep sound effect. And then a jump function, which will play a jump sound when the player actually jumps. So let's jump back into Unity. And as you can see, we have our animator window, <laughs> animator window open. And we can actually start dragging in our animations into this. And this is called the state machine. And the state machine is basically, again, a place where Unity can get can get information about which animation to play. So let's collapse our character animator controller here. And we're not going to worry about all these different animations for now. We're going to start really simple and we're going to start with stand. So by default, on entry, Unity is going to start playing the stand animation. Let's double click on that and ensure loop time is selected. That's going to make it loop. And then what we're going to also do is bring in our run animation. Where are you run? There you are. And we're going to create a transition to that. And we're going to make a transition back to that. And then we're also going to add in a jump animation. We're going to make a transition to that, make a tr transition back to that. We're going to make a transition from run to jump as well. So basically what's going on here is we're saying, hey, Unity, at one point, you're going to want to go from stand to run. Sometimes you want to get going to want to play run and then play stand. Sometimes you're going to want to be standing and then jump. Or sometimes you're going to want to want to be jumping and then standing. So as you can see, we've got a nice little triangle here of states that can go back and forth between one another. I like to keep my an animator state machines really clean. Because again, things get really complicated. So it's important to stay as clean as possible here. Now let's go ahead and create those parameters we were talking about. So let's create a Boolean called grounded. And then let's create a float called speed or velocity X. So these values, these variables are not actually inside of our script, right? These aren't associated with our script. What makes them eventually associated with our script is our script telling the animator what those variables are. So it's telling it to set a Boolean of grounded to whatever the value of our grounded is. And then it's also setting the float of our velocity to whatever that value is. So these will update at runtime when we hit play. Let's jump into the future and I'll show you exactly what we did with each one of our transitions to get everything looking smooth like this. We can jump, it'll go back to running, and then we can run to the right, to the left. If you work on your game throughout the rest of the year, you'll notice that this state machine can get very complicated very fast. But right now, everything is pretty clean, pretty generic. So we've got a transition state from stand to run, and it's basically checking if we're grounded, and if our velocity is greater than 0 0.001, it will play this run animation. If not, it'll go back to stand. Notice how run is set to loop. There are no exit times being applied to any of these transitions. This is checking to see if we're grounded. If we're grounded is false and we're running, we'll play the jump animation. If suddenly we become grounded and the velocity is greater than 0 0.001, meaning we're actually moving horizontally, we'll go back to the run animation. And then finally, if we're jumping and we suddenly become grounded and our velocity, our X velocity is less than 0 0.001, we'll go to the stand animation. And then finally here, the stand animation will play the jump animation if we're not grounded and our velocity is not actually moving. 
So there we go. So let's cover one final element, and that is firing animation events when you're running so that we can get sounds and particle effects to happen. And this is where things can get really cool. This is where you can start creating combat and melee, particle effects, screen shake, make things feel alive. So for this video, all I'm gonna show you is how to create sound effects. So let's click on our character here, and let's go ahead and take a look at our player platformer controller. So what we've got here are two different arrays. We've got a step sounds array, let's set it to three, and then we've got a jump sounds, let's set it to two. And we can go ahead and take a look in our project, and I've actually already got step sound effects available. We can just drag those here, and then we've also got a jump sounds, a set of jump sounds, jump one and jump two. And those are actually not going to fire unless we actually have events in place to actually fire those sound effects. So these little things here are actually events. And what we've done is we've actually created them using this tool here. You can create them and place them. And if you select on them and click here, you can see all the functions available inside of our player script. So we've got one called footstep, we've also got one jump. So these are going to fire when the timeline actually plays and hits them. So let's delete these and just keep these here. We've got a footstep one here and a footstep one here. Those are going to fire the function inside of the player platformer controller script. So these are two scripts that I've just written. And this one's footstep. And again, this is going to play that audio sound. So all it's going to do is look for the step sounds array and choose a random sound from the zero position all the way up to the full length of the sounds array. It's gonna pick a random one every time we run. Flash forward, ultimately this is what you can make your game look like. We've got plenty of different states. We've got a jump state, we've got a land state. We've got particles of grass being emitted using those events in our timeline. We can also click to attack and play the attack animation while playing the run animation. So as you can see, the options are endless for you to create really cool animations for your 2D game. We've even got our parallax effect going on, and we're switching between different screen boxes. Alright guys, those are the fundamentals of making a basic 2D platformer. If you guys like this video and you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon, comment below, do all that fun stuff. If you want to support this channel, get your name in the credits of the next video. Head on over to Patreon support for $5 or more. And if you're interested in getting coached by me, coached on how to make indie games, market indie games, and maybe get some art direction for your game, I'm your guy. Head on over to Patreon and see if that's something for you. Thanks, guys. I'll see you later. Bye.